Today, I'm going to be talking about a career in pediatric anesthesiology. It's really great to be here with all of you. I am an assistant professor at UCSF um, in the Division of Pediatric Anesthesia. So I'm going to talk about two things. The first thing is my career path to becoming a pediatric anesthesiologist. And I'm also going to be talking about a research project that I did recently looking at virtual reality for pediatric patients. So I want to remind you all that a career path is never a straight line. When I was your age, what I thought would happen is that there'd be this straight line all the way to success. However, as I kind of went through my career, I've realized that in many ways, you have no idea what's gonna be ahead of you and things can be all over the place. And that was kind of my life. So I started uh, attending kindergarten in Los Angeles. That's the beginning of my education. And uh, when I was in third grade, my family moved us to Seoul, Korea, where I grew up um, until uh, I started 10th grade, which was in, uh, back in the States, New Hampshire. And then I ended up going to college in Boston. And once I got to college, I was like, okay, now I have a handle on all of this. I'm gonna have a very uh, straightforward path. And so when I first started college, um, this was a very hot thing to be at the time. I know it sounds very dorky, but um, I wanted to be a biochemical engineer. And uh, I started taking engineering classes and then quickly decided that I did not wanna become a biochemical engineer. I actually wanted to be a biochemist. So. I pursued a chemistry major with a minor in biology. And then I decided that maybe before I applied to graduate school, which um, would give you a PhD, I would try doing just pure research for a summer to see how it went. And then during that summer, I realized I no longer wanted to become a biochemist, but I actually wanted to become a doctor. So there were two problems. I made my decision very late. This was the summer between my junior and senior year of college. So I had a couple months to get my um, application together before I would be applying to medical school. The second problem was that I had not taken the MCAT yet. And the MCAT is basically like the SATs, but it's for medical school. And I know I'm dating myself by saying this, but um, at the time, the MCATs were not uh, available by computer. You took the test um, on a paper kind of uh, fill out form. And so they were only um, giving the MCAT twice a year and I had missed the summer spot. So I'd have to wait until the springtime. And some of you may know this, but med school admissions are rolling. So the earlier you can get your application in, the better chance you have of getting a spot. So, Knowing that I had a lot of questions about the med school application process, I went to go find my guidance counselor. And when I told her about my situation, she basically told me I should apply next year. And I was like, no way, I'm, I'm not gonna apply next year. I'm not gonna wait a year. I'm not gonna put my career on hold. But then after kind of talking to other people who were applying to med school, some of my friends who were already in medical school, um, I started to think maybe that might be the best way for me to kind of up my chances of getting into medical school. So I was like, all right, now what do I do, right? And like any, any good pre-med, I decided I was gonna do some research on the AAMC website. Um, and here's a QR code to their website. Um, they have a lot of great resources for kind of any career stage of uh, whether you're applying to med school, already in med school or graduating from med school. But they were like, what to do during a gap year or gap years. And so I was like, okay, what should I do now? So they had several different recommendations. One was take additional coursework. Um, you could get more clinical experience. You could take the MCAT exam, which is definitely something that I was going to do. Um, you could try to reflect on the question of why medicine for your application. You could build healthy habits and they talk a lot about kind of nutrition and sleep and, and exercise. Also learning to budget since it takes a long time to become a doctor and it's always nice to know how to get your finances in order. And then also you could just do something completely unrelated to medicine since you have the rest of your entire life to do medicine. And so this was something that I decided to do. So I was like, I'm gonna do something that I um, would never do again. So. 
I kind of took this drastic decision to um, become a management consultant. So it's essentially going to finance and business. Um, so what is a management consultant? I get asked this question a lot. So management consultants help businesses improve their performance and grow. And how do they do this? Well, they help them solve their problems. So they do a lot of kind of research and analysis to help businesses solve problems that they have or questions and try to answer them. Another thing is that they try to find new and better ways of doing things to try to improve their processes and just make everything more efficient. So I know this has nothing to do really um, on the surface with being a doctor, but I actually apply a lot of these skills on the day to day and I will talk a little bit more about that later in my presentation. All right, so my career in medicine, I guess, is a uh, the tale of two cities between San Francisco and Boston. So I just basically went from coast to coast. I spent four years in medical school at Tufts in Boston. And then I did four years of anesthesia residency at UCSF in San Francisco. And kind of halfway through your residency, you have to decide if you want to pursue a subspecialty, which means do you want to do a different, like a sp specific type of anesthesia? So. I decided that I wanted to do pediatric anesthesia and take care of children. So I did a pediatric anesthesia fellowship back in Boston at Boston Children's Hospital for a year. And then I decided the winters were too cold. And so I decided to come back to San Francisco. So I've been an attending physician here for several years now and I really do love it. So what does an anesthesiologist do? A lot of people ask me this question as well. Well, as an anesthesiologist, I basically take care of my patients before, during, and after surgery. So what do I do before surgery? So my job is to make sure that patients are ready for surgery in terms of are their hearts healthy, are their lungs healthy, and many other things. So we call this a history and physical exam where you go through someone's medical history to see you know, how they're doing right now, why they're having surgery, as well as do they have any other medical conditions that we can make better before we go to surgery. I often tell my patients that having general anesthesia, which means when you go completely off to sleep, it's like running a marathon. So it can really put a lot of stress on your body, especially your heart and your lungs. So it's really important to make sure it's kind of like training for a marathon that your body is in tip top shape before you have your surgery. We, you know, in addition to getting kind of the history by asking questions, we also do the physical exam, like I mentioned, where we listen to the heart lungs, also just look for other signs of any issues. So that's an important part of what I do, just to make sure that people get through their surgery safe and comfortable. And during the surgery, a lot of times my job is to manage uh, basically your breathing, kind of how your heart is doing. And so my first real priority is to make sure that you're safe. But also another thing is to make sure that you're comfortable. One, if you're under general anesthesia, you need to be completely asleep. And I know there's movies that like talk about being awake under general anesthesia. It's very, very rare. We watch our patients like a hawk to make sure that that doesn't happen. Also, we wanna make sure that your pain is well controlled and you're not having really like an unmanageable amount of pain. And so even after the surgery, our job is to watch our patients as they come out of anesthesia, as they wake up, and also minimize the amount of pain they're having after surgery. So there are other um, subspecialists of anesthesia. Uh, you can subspecialize in, in pain medicine and um, also manage their pain long-term. Most importantly, I feel like my job is to really advocate for my patient, especially when they're under general anesthesia and unable to speak for themselves. Job is to make sure that I have their best interests in mind. Now, I know many of you are, um, have not been in an operating room, so I wanted to show you a little bit of a schematic of what the operating room looks like. And we work in teams. It's, it's a very team-based sport here. 
So, you know, we obviously we have our patient who's under general anesthesia in the middle here and the surgeon who's doing the surgery and, and operating. The anesthesiologist is there to really make sure that the patient's vital signs, like your blood pressure, your heart rate, everything looks good. And you can see that monitor um, on the left side where there's like a heart in the lung and, and that's what we're really watching after. And then we also work with scrub nurses as well as circulating nurses who are a team of nurses that help the surgery go smoothly. This is a photo of what uh, an operating room looks like at UCSF. And my position would basically be at the head there in front of the, the computer monitor. And you can see that there on the very, in the middle of the screen is an anesthesia machine that helps patients breathe, as well as a monitor to look at their vital signs. And there's um, carts that have a lot of different equipment and medications needed to keep patients safe and comfortable during surgery. So that's kind of like what my day-to-day -day office looks like. Now, what about pediatric anesthesiologists? Our job is similar, but of course we're taking care of children. Uh, then these are children of all ages, starting with preemies, going to newborns, children, adolescents and teenagers, and sometimes even people who um, are a little bit older than that, who are full adults, but have had a lot of their care at a children's hospital due to having childhood medical conditions. And this is where my job as a patient advocate is really, really important, especially for our patients who are unable to speak for themselves, even when they are not under general anesthesia, like our youngest patients, really wanna make sure that I'm keeping their best interests in mind and making sure that we're doing the right thing for them. All right, so now, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about um, virtual reality. So virtual reality, as many of you know, is the computer generated simulation of a, of a 3D image or a complete environment. And you can interact with it in a, in a real or physical way uh, with someone using special electronic equipment. Now, what does this mean in real life? What it means is that a lot of times you have something like this, which are virtual reality or VR goggles. And um, on the right side, you'll see a little uh, remote control here that you can use with the VR goggles. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how virtual reality can be used to help pediatric patients or children coming in for, for surgery or into the hospital in general. So I'm gonna talk about four different ways. Number one is pain control. Number two is procedural sedation, which means if you're having some kind of procedure, it helps you kind of keep your, um, your anxiety levels low so you're less nervous and able to really uh, tolerate what's, what's happening. Also for preoperative teaching, as well as overall perioperative anxiety. So let's talk first about virtual reality for pain control. So this is a study that was done a few years ago in 2018, actually by um, someone across the Bay, uh, in the East Bay at Children's Hospital Oakland. And what they looked at was um, virtual reality as a pain therapy for patients who have sickle cell disease. Now, sickle cell disease is a, a disease process where your blood cells um, kind of look a little bit different. And so you can have a lot of uh, pain episodes when they start to clump together. And this can cause a lot of pain. And so a lot of these children come in to the hospital to be admitted overnight for pain control. And this pain can become very, very hard to manage over time. And so what they did was they used these VR goggles, which um, you can see on the left, there's a patient who's wearing those VR goggles. And on the right, you'll see the image that they're seeing. And this was basically um, kind of a, an underwater environment where they could interact with different sea animals and, and really kind of try to escape from the hospital room and experience this virtual environment. And they found that you know, children had um, much better pain scores when they were able to really kind of distract themselves and, and go to this kind of place outside of the hospital. So that's one way you can use virtual reality. Another way you can use virtual reality, as I mentioned earlier, is for procedural sedation. 
Um, and as I said, sedation is so you're able to kind of tolerate these uh, procedures that we do. For example, some procedure examples are dressing changes. Say you like hurt yourself and now you have like a, a Band-Aid and we wanna make sure that we're changing it. And it can, it can hurt a lot if you're already having, for example, like a big skin injury or burn injury and you're changing those dressings that can cause a lot of pain. And so if you put VR goggles on someone, once again, it can help distract them from that pain that they're experiencing. Also, a PIV refers to a peripheral IV. So many of you may have um, gone to the hospital if you're sick and they're um, put in an IV in your arm or, or, you know, or your hands so you can get medications intravenously. And that you know, involves a needle, so it can definitely hurt. So we sometimes use, virtu sometimes use virtual reality goggles to kind of distract from that, that needle being placed in your hand. And next thing is uh, implanted port access. Uh, so an implanted port is, is very similar to a peripheral IV, except it usually goes into your chest. And it's also a way of people to get, for people to get um, intravenous medications. Um, but that can certainly be painful as well because you also need to use a needle. Um, there was recently a research study that looked at hormonal implant placements. And basically this is like a little kind of, um, like little hormone kind of, uh, I don't know how to call it, but it's like a small like tube type thing that goes in your arm. And as you can imagine, it can be really hurt. Um, it can hurt a lot when you, when you place that. So having um, a combination of, you know, virtual reality goggles with some numbing medication can certainly help with that as well. And finally, there are peripheral nerve blocks. What peripheral nerve blocks mean is when you inject numbing medication around uh, the nerves that go to a certain piece, certain part of your body. So for example, you're having arm surgery and you can numb the nerves that are going to your arm so you don't feel anything. I think a good way to think about this is when you're going to the dentist and they inject some numbing medication and now you can't feel anything and you know, you're not supposed to like chew or anything because you might accidentally you know, um, cause some damage or injury there. So what you're doing is, is injecting some numbing medication around certain areas of your body. And at the dentist, you know, sometimes you, it can really hurt when you're injecting numbing medication. And so once again, you can use virtual reality to help with when you're placing those types of nerve blocks because it can really burn a lot when you're placing them. So virtual reality comes in two flavors, um, passive and active. <laughs> what do I mean by this? Well, passive is when you're not really kind of doing anything. You're just kind of taking it all in or, or watching things. So this is kind of like if you're watching a movie, watching a YouTube video, you're not really doing anything, you're just watching. And so that um, is what we would call like a passive VR. Active means you're, you're actively doing something. So in this example, it would be like, if you're playing a game, you're interacting very, um, you know, you're interacting with the environment in a more direct way. So just keep this in mind, there's passive VR and active VR. And what is the difference here? Um, it really depends on your cognitive load. And cognitive load is kind of like how much is, is going on and stimulating your brain. So if you're doing um, passive VR, like watching a video, you're not using that much of your brain. Um, so it's, it's more of like a, a low cognitive load state. However, if you're you know, actively kind of playing a game, then you have much more of a high cognitive load. So you really want to think about what is, um, what is the level of distraction I want to provide um, during these procedures. If you think that something is going to hurt a lot, you want to use something that is very distracting, which means you're using something with a high cognitive load. On the other hand, if it's something that's not very painful, um, you can use something that's more of a low cognitive load. And this might be watching, once again, something like a video. So the next uh, real application of virtual reality for, for kids is uh, helping with kind of preparing someone before they, they come in for a certain procedure. And this study actually looked at um, when you get an x-ray. So kids had to come in for a chest x-ray, really kind of 
stand still and kind of either take a deep breath in or deep breath out. And um, a lot of kids, you know, obviously going to the hospital is really scary. Um, being around these gigantic machines and these rooms where it's very unfamiliar can be really, really scary when you think about it. So this is really to make sure that the kids like kind of know what to expect ahead of time and also teach them like how do you how do you pose for getting a chest x-ray um, and that is basically the, you if you put on the goggles you see something like this where you have a child and a and a robot and they would kind of go over the whole process with you it's kind of like when you're about to take a test i guess or if you're about to do like a, a game and you're kind of going to like a different school and you're not really sure what to expect but if you were able to kind of see the environment you, you can kind of I guess, visualize yourself better there. And so it really helps take away at least that part of kind of the stress of, of either taking an exam or playing a sport or like playing a game. So that's um, one thing that, you know, has been studied. We are also doing a study at UCSF looking at um, MRI uh, preoperative teaching. So an MRI scan um, can take like up to an hour and you have to lie super duper still in this like tiny like uh, tube. So it can be it can be difficult. Now they've made the tubes a little bit bigger so it's not as claustrophobic, but certainly um, it's really hard to stay very still. There's all these like weird clicking noises that happen. And so we do have a, kind of a program where we go through the different um, MRIs and the MRI sounds so people know what to expect because um, it's always better to know what you expect before you go in there, especially if you have to lie still for like an hour or so. So uh, the last kind of application I'm going to talk about is, is virtual reality for anxiety. So these are some common phobias that have um, been treated with virtual reality. And, and you may recognize a few. Um, claustrophobia, as I said, kind of being in a tight space, that's very scary. Also, on the other hand, really open spaces can be scary too. Um, a lot of people have be a fear of public speaking. Um, also flying can be scary. Heights, I'm very scared of heights as well as spiders. So these are all things that um, virtual reality has, has helped with uh, people getting over their, their phobias. So today I'm gonna talk specifically about perioperative anxiety. So what do I mean by perioperative anxiety? Um, Basically, that means when you're coming in for surgery, you're really anxious, either before, during, or after. And the kind of interesting thing about perioperative anxiety is that if you're really anxious before the surgery, it can lead to behavioral changes after the surgery. And so they've looked at young kids who were really, really anxious about the process. And they found that even up to like two weeks later, these young kids had night terrors, like have nightmares, also had like some bedwetting behavior. So it has some implications for kind of after the fact, which is why you really want to prevent people from developing this type of anxiety. Now, um, I told you that I was going to come back to why management consulting has been helpful for my career. So when I was a management consulting, this is consultant, this is one of the kind of approaches we had to solving problems. And it's called design thinking. And uh, it's really a, a human-centered approach to innovation. And what do I mean by human-centered? So in this case, if you're trying to help children with perioperative anxiety, you're really thinking about what does the child want, right? So you wanna come up with a solution that is, I guess, acceptable or wanted by, by the child. Other kind of different lenses to see this is also viability. Is this financially possible, which is, you know, kind of looking at the realistic view of it. Another realistic view to look at it is feasibility. Is this something that is physically or technically doable? So you want to be kind of in the in the middle area of the Venn diagram here. And that's where your innovation sweet spot is. So I tend to, you know, when I'm trying to solve problems or kind of clinical issues, I really look um, through these three different lenses to see if there's anything we can do to help solve the problem. So there are five steps of design thinking, um, starting with empathize. Second step is define. Next step is to ideate. Finally, prototype and then test. 
And I'll go through each of these steps within the kind of lens of how do we improve kind of perioperative anxiety. So number one is to empathize. So you really wanna see the situation in this case from the child's standpoint. So a lot of the kids that I meet in the, uh, in the preoperative or the, the pre um, kind of surgery holding area look like this when they see me, they're very not happy to see me. And it kind of hurts my feelings sometimes, but it's, it's okay, totally understandable. Um, so what is so scary about going under general anesthesia? Well, a lot of times we use a mask to go off to sleep and it does have to be very tight on the child's face. And as you can imagine, this can be really claustrophobic and scary when a stranger is coming at you looking something like this. And so I can totally understand why this is really, really scary and um, why kids, you know, once they ha have this experience, some kids have to come back multiple times and, and they get terrified every time they think of, of this happening again. So the next step is to define and the define step involves uh, coming up with a problem statement. And a problem statement is a sentence that defines your problem and it starts with the phrase, how might we? So in this case, the phrase would be, how might we reduce perioperative anxiety in children having surgeries? It's usually a very straightforward kind of sentence there to kind of frame what kind of problem you're trying to solve. The next step is ideate. So this means you kind of brainstorm different ideas and try to see which one to really kind of use as a potential solution for your problem. So in this case, for pre-op anxiety, you could try to prepare the child, you could use some medications, you could try to distract them, or you can try to reassure them. And these are only you know, a few of like an infinite number of ideas you can have to solve this problem. So once you have your ideas, you wanna prototype them. So what does that mean? It's trying to come up with a way to test your idea. So let's say your idea is we're going to prepare our child to um, kind of come to the operating room, much like I showed you with the x-ray example. So you can either kind of like read them a book going through like what it's like to go to surgery. And there's a lot of books that kind of um, are out there to describe this in more detail to children so they know what to expect. One of our brain surgeons um, actually goes through a virtual reality application with the, the patient kind of like mapping out their, their kind of their brain and, and showing them what they're gonna do. And that's a different way that you can also prepare the child. So they kind of really have a better grasp of what exactly is gonna happen. So those are two prototypes, once again, of, of an infinite number of prototypes you can use. Another idea is, is medications. So there's a lot of different um, anti-anxiety medications that are out there and you can certainly um, try them and see how that goes. Next is reassurance. And so, you know, obviously kids are very reassured by their parents being there. So you can either bring your, the parents, you know, directly back to the operating room until the child goes to sleep. Uh, another thing you can do actually with virtual reality is have a parent like not in the operating room, but in a different like waiting room or area where they have the, the, these VR goggles on and they can kind of talk to the child that way. And so that's another, um, application for virtual reality. And then the last thing, you know, that I'm going to talk about is, is distraction. And so how do you prototype that? Well, um, when I was a fellow at Boston Children's, we used to have clown doctors, uh, which works well for some people and not for some other people. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Inside Out, but, you know, it can definitely be really scary. Um, so you just want to think about, you know, is, is the child going to be receptive to, to this type of distraction with a, with a clown doctor? Um, this, you know, you see many children these days, it's amazing how, how young they are and they're able to kind of work with the, with the iPhones or the, or the Androids. And so you can have a video on there or some kind of music playing or video, like, you know, movies. And so that's one way to really distract them. And then like, this is a, this is a child at our, um, at our hospital and they have the virtual reality goggles on and you can, this is certainly a different way to do it. It's a little bit more immersive, obviously, than using a, a phone in your hand. So we decided we are going to test this VR prototype. So we decided to look at children between the ages of five 
and 12. Like if you're too small, then the VR goggles don't fit well. And if you're too old, then the games might be a little bit too childish for you to play. And we were looking at kids who were having general anesthesia with a, with a mask induction. Um, and induction means like go, just going under anesthesia. So um, we wanted to see if we could distract them from having a mask on their face. And we looked at virtual reality, uh, patients who had VR goggles versus patients who did not have VR goggles. And we measured the children's anxiety levels using a, like a scoring system. Uh, this is what the VR gameplay looks like. If you could kind of pick, choose between two different games, um, the left one is called uh, Space Pups, I believe. And it's kind of like, I don't know if you guys play Guitar Hero, maybe that's like too old of a game, but um, you basically kind of go left and right and, and play the, the game and it plays a song as you go. So that was like one way to be, you know, as I said, kind of more of a high cognitive load to be very distracting. The um, one on the right, it's called Pebbles the Penguin, where you're a penguin trying to catch as many pebbles as you can. Um, so that's a different, those are two different options of, of kind of high cognitive load active VR simulations. And so what did we find from our study? Well, we looked at anxiety scores, as I said, and um, these were done by like a separate observer. So the gray bars are time zero, T zero. Um, and this is really looking at the, the baseline. Where were they in the preoperative holding area, so the pre-surgery area before you went into the operating room where you like check in and it's like the waiting room. And we found that the number was, as you can imagine, the same uh, at 28. So a higher score means you're more anxious. And so they were both like a 28.3, um, as you can imagine, like no difference between the two because you haven't really divided up the groups yet. Um, so time one is when you get into the operating room and those are the yellow squares here or the yellow bars. And we found that if you had no virtual reality, which is on the left, your score went up by about five points when you got into the operating room because you're like, oh, like what, what's going on? Where am I, right? But if you had the VR goggles on, didn't, there was like no increase in that anxiety score probably because you didn't like even realize you were in the operating room. Um, and then, Time two is when you're inducing general anesthesia where you're putting the child to, to sleep under general anesthesia with the mask. And here you can see that there is a much higher jump in their anxiety score since, you know, as, as you kind of looked at the photo earlier, someone's coming at you with a mask like this. And so their scores went up to 45. But if you had the virtual reality goggles on, your score still remained the same. So you were kind of still playing your game and didn't realize that you were going off to sleep because you're so distracted. I'm sure some of you guys who play games or watching TV have, have heard your parents kind of call you to dinner or something and you like haven't heard them for the first like three times. And that's kind of what was happening here. So to summarize this whole process, you know, our problem statement was how might we reduce perioperative anxiety in children having surgery? And then our potential solution was to use VR goggles during inhaled induction. So what do we learn from this process? You know, I don't know if you guys know who Bob Ross is, but I'm a big fan of him. He's like a, he does this like painting series and it's very relaxing. But one of his phrases is there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. So you always learn from kind of all of your experiences. And what we learned from this process was that it takes a team. So we have um, child life specialists. Um, they're especially um, trained people who kind of really know how to manage a child's anxiety and kind of explain things in a way that's very um, understandable to even young children. So we work together very closely with our child life specialists. We also learned that VR doesn't work for everyone. So you wanna think about like, who would this work for? So someone who's kind of calm and chill, like, yes, that person, you can put VR goggles on. But if you have some situation like this, where a child is like already really upset, like they are not going to be okay with putting on VR goggles. Like, I want to see my parents. Like, I want to get out of here. I don't want you to touch me. So that is not the child where you're going to try to put VR goggles on. So what's next? Um, we're actually taking this a step further with um, augmented reality. And augmented reality is a little bit different from virtual reality because virtual reality, you only see what's on really on, on the phone or in the goggles. But augmented reality, it's a kind of like, what is that, Pokemon Go, where you have like, 
you can see the reality, but you can also see these little kind of characters that are superimposed upon the environment that's around you. And we find that this is really helpful when you have like kids who really want to see their parents, right? Um, and or who really want to know what's going on because they can see what's going on around them, but they're also distracted by what's going on on the augmented reality goggles. And so we have this robot character, she's called Jenny the robot, and she actually blows bubbles and is very distracting, but you can see that what, behind her, you can see the operating room. So this really helps um, kids, once as I, said, as I said before, who really wanna kind of are really curious about everything that's happening around them. And here's a child on the right who's wearing the VR goggles and um, is, is pretty much using his mask to induce himself, which is, is really nice because he doesn't have that experience of someone coming at him with the mask. He's more just like putting it on himself. And so he'll be less, less afraid next time. So that's um, all I have for my presentation. Thank you everyone for, for paying attention. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I see a question from Josh D. How has COVID-19 affected your work? So, um, Anesthesiologists, I don't think anyone really knew what we did. Even my own brother didn't know what I did um, until COVID-19, where a big part of our job is to place a breathing tube in someone who needs a breathing tube to either breathe or for surgery. And so, as you can imagine, it can be very anxiety provoking when you're very close to someone's mouth placing a breathing tube. So that um, has definitely led to a lot of um, anxiety to, for people. Um, and we definitely wear a lot of um, PPE or personal protective equipment. And it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely very tough um, because, you know, especially with now, this is, I think, I believe the fourth wave of COVID and um, every time it gets a little bit tougher and tougher, but definitely it's, it's a very meaningful job. I find it very important to be able to take care of patients who are sick, um, including those with COVID. And um, especially I work at a children's hospital. Um, children are not vaccinated below the age of 12. And so they are still a very, very high risk population. Was there anything in your career path that you wish you had done differently? Oh, that's a great one. You know, I don't know, it's, it's hard. Cause like you always have these questions about like, what if, like, what if I had joined, you know, Facebook early on or something, but I feel like I'm, I'm really happy with the way things turned out for me. And um, I think it's really like, I wish I wouldn't, wasn't as bummed about things like, especially when I had to take that extra year off. I actually ended up taking two years off because I love management consulting so much. Um, but I wish I hadn't been as sad about the times where things seemingly didn't go my way. Um, I wish I kind of could have embraced back then. Um, it would have saved me a lot of kind of anxiety and worrying if I had kind of known that, you know, things um, really would kind of turn out in the end. I think um, one thing to remember is as long as you're kind of true to your, this sounds so cheesy, but um, as long as you're like kind of true to yourself and, and you like are, are really doing what's best like for you and your career goals, like it all um, works out in the end. I think it's like the times when I was really trying to work against that is, is when things didn't go so well. What innovations in the last decade have affected your work? Oh, wow. Um, so obviously virtual reality, um, I think is in the last decade. Um, other things are really, you know, we are always looking at ways to kind of improve our processes. And so I don't, I don't know, I think having, you know, for example, iPhones, I mean, I don't know, I'm really making myself sound really old, but uh, we didn't have like iPhones when I was growing up. Um, we had pagers and uh, like mobile phones. Um, so I think that has really improved just, I think ability to communicate better to uh, with our, with my colleagues and with kind of my, my patients. I think that has, has really helped a lot. And then obviously from the medical standpoint, we always have new devices and medications that are coming out um, to make our processes even more safe. And so I think it's a kind of a, a constant, you know, you always, it's a, they call it like continuous learning or, or lifetime learning in medicine. And there's always new medical innovations that are coming out. And so you wanna make sure that you're staying on top of all that. 
what is your greatest accomplishment in terms of your career? <laughs> so um, I think, you know, I um, one of my big passions, um, I'm our associate chair of well-being for um, my department, which means it's, you know, going back to the first question, COVID-19 has been very difficult for everybody. Um, and it's taken a great mental health toll on, you know, people inside and outside of medicine. You saw from the Olympics, just the mental health is becoming a huge issue. And it's really like shone a light on kind of these issues and how, especially when you're very high performing, perfectionist or, or any of those things, um, it can really take a toll. And so um, my job is for my department, I manage, you know, these um, well-being for our, our fellow physicians and staff and trainees, like, you know, medical students and residents. Um, and I also do this on a national level. And I think it's really about um, helping physicians and, and other um, healthcare professionals really ask for help when you need it and um, not feel judged. I, I mean, I feel like you probably all have had that experience where you don't feel comfortable asking for help. Um, and especially when people think that, you know, you're a superhero or whatever, um, they talk about healthcare heroes. And I think just making um, sure that people get the help they need and making sure that's okay. So that's, I know it doesn't sound very medical, but it's, it's very important um, in terms of making sure that we have a, a culture of kindness in medicine. And it's, it's something that I find important, not even just in medicine. I believe there is one more question in the chat from. Oh yeah, yes. Why? Sorry. Why did you specifically choose the pediatric section of anesthesiology? Thank you for that question. Um, I actually, when it's like kind of like how my whole career has been, I thought I was going to go into um critical care or intensive care, where um the intensive care unit is a place where people go when they're like really really sick. Um, and uh, an intensive care it's called the ICU as well, and um critical care doctors are doctors who take care of those people who are in the ICUs who are very, very sick and need a lot um, of active kind of, you know, medicine and management. Um, so I did that. And then I, uh, I thought I was going to love it and I didn't. Um, and I started taking care of, we have these like different rotations. It's almost like different courses where you go and see different um, parts of of anesthesia. And I had never thought I would be taking care of kids, to be honest. I mean, it was definitely not even on my like top three choices of what I was going to do, but I went and did it and I like loved it so much. It was, it was just so fun. I found it so meaningful to be able to take care of really young children who had their whole life in front of them. And, you know, we're here for, um, you know, some kind of illness or needed some kind of surgery. You know, there's really sick kids and there's really healthy kids, but they all came here needing surgery. And to to be able to get them through that um, like safely as well as comfortably and really try to kind of decrease their anxiety because everyone's super anxious when they come in for surgery. That was really meaningful to me. And so I, I really, I'm really glad that I found pediatric anesthesia. Um, and I would recommend that all of you really like go out there and just try things. Like if you're, if you're thinking about it, cause you may love it or you may hate it, but at least you you know, you're going in there with some kind of idea of, of what you want to do. At which age did you realize that pediatric anesthesiology is what you wanted to pursue? Did you look up to someone? So actually no one in my family is, is in medicine except for my younger sister. So I didn't really know anything about medicine. Um, I think my mom's like best friend was a doctor and that was like the closest I came to it. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't really decide until like I was well into anesthesia. So that was like my mid mid 20s like late 20s when I when I found that so um yeah and I was fortunately like knock on wood I didn't have to go um into the hospital as a child very much so I didn't really know anything about like built, like pediatric surgery or pediatric anesthesiologist until I became an anesthesia resident myself um, it is a huge committee to become a doctor and help better this world thank you for everything you do um there are so many considerations. One of the considerations, is it hard to achieve a good work-life balance as a doctor? These are great questions. You're definitely coming in with your eyes open. Um, so I like the word work-life integration. Um, it's, you know, a lot of time feel like, you know, it's like a balance where, you know, one thing um, gets more priority than the other thing doesn't. But 
uh, I think in your life, you can find a way to kind of make it so it kind of fits a little bit better, like it's more integrated. And what I say, and, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with like Marie Kondo, she has a TV show um, and she's also like a big organizer and she always says like, you should only keep the things that spark joy. And that's definitely the way I, I look at my career. I only do projects like, like talking to you today that spark joy for me. And so um, because I'm, I'm doing that, I feel like I'm a lot happier even when I do have times where I, I have more work, but it's all work that I find meaningful. And they've actually found that um, being able to dedicate at least kind of like 20% of your time at work to something you find meaningful is, is protective against becoming burnt out. Um, and I think that's why it's so important to find meaning in what you do. So yeah, I, th I think it's good to kind of know about the, the work-life balance issues beforehand, but also creating good solutions. And I think if you're able to really hone in on the things you love about medicine or whatever career you decide and be able to focus on that, that's gonna really help you in the long-term. Wow, oh, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, going back a bit in your presentation, I was wondering which skills you continue to apply from being a management consultant? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I, I use a lot of, as you saw today, um, PowerPoint skills. <laughs> um, one of my jobs is actually to help um, kind of CEOs of companies uh, make, you know, kind of present their ideas in a way that was kind of made, made sense. And um, because of that, I use a lot of PowerPoint. So PowerPoint is one of the skills I use a lot, like on a practical level. So it's always helpful to really think about, you know, how to, it's not just like making pretty slides, but it's making slides that really convey your idea as a story. So I, you know, I learned a lot about like storytelling. It's a lot about like, even if you have like the best idea, like, I mean, I'm sure you guys know about um, kind of people who have like great ideas, but nobody wants to listen to them because they're not great at either communicating their ideas or they don't get along with people. And so I think that's one thing that I learned a lot of is it's not just about having a good idea, it's being able to communicate that idea well. So that's a skill that I use a lot um, in terms of really thinking about the person that I'm talking to and making sure that whether it's in my, my clinical day to day, like whether I'm meeting a, a young child, like where they are in terms of explaining things or whether I'm trying to talk to a colleague about a certain idea, uh, it's really thinking about like meeting your audience where they are. And so that's a big skill that I, I use. And then I think it's also, uh, I think in medicine, there's like this whole, like in the past, they focused a lot about like how like, kind of like there's the concept of like book smart and street smart, I guess. Um, and so in kind of other terms, it would be the uh, sense of IQ versus EQ. And so I'm sure a lot of you guys know what IQ is, but EQ is kind of your emotional intelligence. And it's really like, are you able to have like situational awareness? Do you have awareness of like your own like strengths and weaknesses? And like kind of how, how well are you able to play with others? And so that is something that I really um, never really thought about something that you had to learn specifically. But when I became a consultant, like our first week of like, whatever, like intern boot camp or whatever is, was talking about that specific, like how do you build emotional intelligence? How do you train that? And that is something that um, I have really taken to heart. And uh, I actually teach our, our residents. So those, these are anesthesiologists in training. I have a whole kind of curriculum I've developed for them to really develop their emotional intelligence. Because when you think about, you know, eventually you all will become leaders, I'm sure. And when you think about successful leaders, it's not really much about like how much like they specifically know in terms of their IQ or book smarts. It's really about how well are they able to bring teams together and work with others and make sure that, you know, everyone can contribute. And I think that's really a skill that I very specifically learned as a management consultant and has served me very well in my current job as a doctor as well. Yeah, those skills are certainly something I've not thought of intentionally. So hopefully we will be able to take it to heart from now and like strive to gain them in the future. Yeah. Uh, but moving on the topic of virtual reality, since the studies seem to be relatively new, has VR been like popularized in larger hospitals for things like preoperative teaching or pain relief? 
Yeah, so there's, it's definitely like a very new field and a lot of studies are being done currently to look at it. There's actually a, um, I think it's an international, if not national um, consortium of different um, anesthesiologists who are really looking at the application of VR to, you know, whether it's patients who already had surgery and were managing their pain or they're coming in for surgery or even during surgery. Um, some people like actually you can, put the VR goggles on during like an arm surgery or something and, and numb up their nerves. And um, they actually don't feel anything. They're just like watching a video. And so it, it's pretty amazing to see. Oh, I believe there's one question from Carter in the chat. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> what daily tasks bring you the most satisfaction? Um, I love taking care of children. I really do. It's like, it's really great when you see them and, you know, going back to like the masks where they have to wear like the little mask and they're so scared. Like my favorite thing is to like ask them like, what flavor do you want in your mask? We have this like great assortment of different flavors like watermelon or, you know, uh, strawberry, chocolate, root beer. Um, and like just ask them and it kind of like takes them out of like the the like the operating room or the hospital setting it kind of brings them back kind of like almost like you're asking like your favorite like flavor of ice cream they get like all excited and they're so focused on this and the parents are all like excited and, and that's kind of I think really what I find really meaningful to me is is, is taking this child who's like so scared and kind of giving them a, a way to really engage with me um in a way that's more, more genuine and kind of like how they would engage with me like outside of the hospital and like my personal favorite, if you mix like watermelon and, and lemonade, it tastes like a pink Starburst, which is like, my, I love pink Starburst. So that's what I will usually do if someone's like, I can't decide, which happens a lot, but um, definitely things like that, where you're really able to help a child get through it. It's, they, you know, they're being so brave um, coming in and there, you know, you can see like, you know, they're trying to pull back tears and then you're able to really help them do that. That I think is, it brings me the most satisfaction. Yeah, um, I wasn't aware that there would be flavors for their masks, and it sounds amazing to engage yeah. your children like that. Uh, but as high school students interested in going into the medical field, what advice would you have for us? So I would definitely, um, you know, say that you should have an open mind. As I said, a lot of the experience that I had that I thought was like completely irrelevant to going into medicine are very relevant. So whatever experience you have, really try to build on the skills you learn. Um, and also I think it's, once again, kind of really going in with your eyes open. So if you have opportunities to, you know, shadow in the hospital or participate in kind of the day-to-day -day medical activities, I think those are all great ways of getting information to be like, do you even want to do this? Because I think for me, if I had not gone into like doing a research project over a whole summer and just doing that like I think I would have definitely made the mistake of of going into trying to become a biochemist and I know for a fact I would not have enjoyed it so I think it's about really gaining more experience um, whether it helps you move towards or away from medicine but just um, being true to kind of who you are and and what what your wants and needs are. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinski, for all of this advice. I think this is definitely something that all of us can apply um, to our lives, even if, like you said, we're not planning on going into medicine. Um, I did have a question about your personal experiences um, that you've had specifically. Um, is there something that you wish you had done differently in, in your career that you perhaps learned from? Yeah, um, let me see. I mean, I feel like, you know, people ask me this question a lot and I really like, don't really have anything I wish I would have done differently. I feel like maybe if you had asked me like three or four years ago, I would have, but looking back on kind of my experience, I think I'm at a point where I can see why certain things happened. And I, you know, I think, let me see, I, I wanna come up with a good answer for you, but I don't really um, have anything I wish I would have done differently. Maybe it's being more, um, more open, you know, going back to my work with well-being, I felt like there were times where I felt like I was all alone um, in terms of, you know, obviously medicine and any other real field it has its struggles, but 
you'll once you open up kind of about your experiences other people do too and you realize that like it's a kind of a shared experience that a lot of people feel the same way that you do and so I feel like if if you're able to to do that that would kind of help you a lot. Thank you so much for that Dr. Sinski. Um, one question that we often get when we're planning for the webinars um, is was there a time that you went above and beyond for a patient? Oh man. Um, <laughs> I think um, I'm trying to do this in a way that um, kind of preserves their their privacy. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we have patients who are really, really critically ill, um, who um, are, it's like a life or death situation. And so I think being, there are definitely times where I've uh, had to really kind of step in and take care of patients, whether it's late at night or, or very like early in the morning to make sure that they kind of went through, they have like very critical illness, big surgeries and trying to get them through that. I think that's something. And, and I think it's because I'm um, in pediatric anesthesia, it's not just about the child, it's all about the, about the parents as well. I think the, the parents, if anything, are so invested in their child's health and well-being, and so I think um, I've definitely taken extra steps to make sure that parents really understand what's happening and, and giving them what we call like full informed consent um, while trying to make sure that they're not also developing a lot of anxiety about the situation because it's a very stressful situation. So I think that's something that um, a lot of kind of uh, when, you, when you're taking care of a really critically ill patient, um, can kind of slip your mind is, is really taking care of the, the whole family too. And that's definitely something that I've, I've tried to do. Thank you so much, like Roger said, um, for everything that you do um, in your profession, not just for patients, um, but as you just said, parents too. Um, a final question that I have just gotten in the chat um, is, were there any concerns that you had before you entered the medical field? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think um, as uh, was brought up earlier about the, the work-life balance by Roger, that was a, a huge concern for me. Also, I think just the financial aspect of it. It's a, it's a huge financial commitment and especially going from, from working um, in, in finance where the, you know, coming straight out of college, like you make a lot of money and whatnot to going into a situation where you're in school paying tuition, it was, it was very, uh, very jarring for me. So I think those were kind of the, the main concerns, you know, I would recommend like, if you're going to do it for the money, like don't go into medicine, there are plenty of other ways to do it, do it because you love it. And that's really for any field, right? You can, um, if you enjoy the work you do, it's, it's going to just make your life so much richer. And I'll, I'll leave you with this quote. Like my mom actually told me this when I was um, younger. And I, rem I think about it a lot, like, um, you can, you can make 10 times more money than someone, but you're never going to have 10 times more time. So if anything, your time is worth more than your money. And so make sure you're spending your time on things that are meaningful to you and are going to bring you joy.